What do you say, Mark? <laughs> Pretty true, huh? I know. Vicky always says to me, you know you're wrong. I say, yeah, baby, I know I'm wrong. So I might be wrong about this, but ladies and gentlemen, I don't mind telling you, I don't think I am. Maria Montessori agrees with what I'm going to tell you now. Kids will read when they're ready, not when you're ready. Some kids aren't ready to read in grade three. And the other day when I was watching, because I, I was in Fort Francis, and all I could get was that bloody debate, the Republican debate, where the joint IQ is about 37. <laughs> and I remember uh, Jeb Bush standing in front of the audience saying, in my state of Texas, when you're in grade three, if you can't pass the reading t t test, you do not move on to grade four. And I looked at him and I said, oh, can you spell loser? I'm just, what? Some kids in grade three aren't ready to read. They're just physically not ready to read. And Fred, if you haven't figured it out yet, can I enlighten you to something? Girls mature more quickly than boys. And if you haven't figured that out yet, go watch any grade eight class walk out of the school. The grade eight girls walk out looking like runaway models. And the boys walk out with snot halfway down their mouths. They look like grade threes. They're just, I'm not kidding you. Some of us never mature, but I will say this. In grade three, little girls are ready. Give me a book, I'll read. Little boys say, read this book. I want to go pee in the sandbox. No, 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 you read. I want to go pee. Let them pee. There is no hurry. We are obsessed by America's push to get kids reading young, young, young. Some boys in grade three aren't ready to read. All they need is time. So what's it take to become a reader? First thing it takes is time. My daughter was a slow starter. She didn't walk. She didn't talk, talk until she was later. When she went to GNS in kindergarten, she wanted a letter from me and it said, Victoria's got a thousand books in her bedroom. My dad who reads her every night, she thinks she's an awesome reader. Under no circumstances will she write any exams from outside of her school. Under no circumstances will you take her out for remedial reading. She thinks she's awesome. Hands off. She didn't write a provincial exam. A standardized test exam until she was in grade six. And she was on the honor roll. I gave my baby the time. That's the first thing they need. Second thing they need, by the way, as Indigenous people, we don't struggle with time. We've got the same issues that everybody has. But the other two issues, we have. The second thing it takes to become a reader is a hero. And our elders are not the readers they should be because of those bloody residential schools. Our elders are not the readers they should be because up till now, we haven't been in books. You don't want to read a book if you can't identify with it. There's not a reserve in Canada where an elder's got his name on the waiting, or her name on the waiting list for Lord of the Rings. We don't do Lord of the Rings. We have our own little people. Not those little guys in Lord of the Rings. Uh, Hobbits. Hobbits. We have our own little people, different cultures, but it's, we don't identify with that. And we weren't in books. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know who the most famous First Nation person is in the world? His name? Hiawatha. You know who made him famous? An American from Kentucky in 1877 called Henry Longfellow. And you know what he said about Hiawatha? Listen to this. Oh, by the way, how do I know that? I've got a friend in Edmonton. His name is Tolulwa Molel. He's an author from Tanzania. And I said to Tolulwa one day, he said, Tolulwa, who's the most famous native person in the world? And he said, Hiawatha. And I said, how do you know that? He said, David, I studied Hiawatha in fourth grade in Tanzania, in the Swahili language. And I said, shut up. He said, no. I said, tell me who you know. Friends, he went like this. By the shores of Gichigumi, by the shiny big sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon, Nokomis. I said, that's unbelievable. The most famous First Nation person in the world is all wrong. Why? Because the American who wrote his story didn't have a clue. He was just writing beautiful poetry. The rhythm and the rhyme is awesome. He got it all wrong. Are you listening to this? By the shores of Gichigumi? Wrong. Hiawatha wasn't from Lake Superior. He was from Lake Ontario. By the shores of Gichigumi, by the shiny big sea water, big sea water, Gordon Lightfoot called big sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis. Wrong. Nokomis is grandma in Ojibwe, and Hiawatha wasn't Ojibwe, he was an Ondaga. Does anybody care? We care. We were mortal enemies at the time. The Onondaga were killing our women, taking us prisoners. Who would dare call Hiawatha Nokomis? Sucks. All wrong. Friends, we have been not there. And for the first time in history, we're showing up. People like me, Andy Everson, Joseph Boyd and Richard Wagamese, Carol Dumont, they were showing up and we're writing books so kids can see themselves and that's the first factor. You've got to see yourself. It takes three things to become a reader. Time, it takes a hero, and our elders aren't the heroes that they should be. They're not the readers they should be. It's going to be that new generation. And our kids are starting to read because they're showing up. You know one of my favorite series ever for First Nation kids is Twilight. Twilight. Do you know why? The hero is not Bella Swan. She is a moron. If you've read the books, she's 18 years old. Her, her IQ is 18. She's got an option. She's got, for those who haven't seen it, Jacob Black, the kid is native. I mean, his body is a Greek god. 
<laughs> he is so good looking, it's nauseating. The kid's got, he's got a heart of gold, he's compassionate, he's giving, caring, and at night the kid turns into a bloody golden wolf. Or she's got option B, the pasty white guy. <laughs> Edward Cullen, six foot four, not a muscle in his lineage. And what does Cullen turn into when the sun, I do not Sun goes down and the moon comes up? You know, some, some creature's gonna suck the blood out of our, our reserve dogs if we don't tie them up. And what does she opt for? She opts for the white guy, Edward Cullen. There's not an Aboriginal person in the world that's looking at her and say, epic failure, you're such a loser. <laughs> but we were reading it because of him, Jacob Black, and his group, his nation. I know, there's stuff that's showing up. It takes three things to become a reader. It takes time, it takes a hero, and we're making our own heroes right now. And my job is to make sure that every one of you knows kids need a hero. And if they don't have it at home, you've got to put on your hero hat. And when they come into you, you make sure they see you reading because you have the power of those kids. And the third thing it takes is books. No books, no reading. And we haven't had them. Now we have them. Your job is to make sure you get the right books into their hands. Graphic novels. Da, 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 da. And it goes on and on. I demonstrated a couple for you this morning. I demonstrated uh, the one uh, that I gave away. I told that story. And then I told you the second story, the, the seven sacred teachings that I'd like to give one of you now. What are the three things it takes to become a reader? Don't say it, just raise your arm. It takes three things to become a reader. Raise your arm and we go. Here we go. Time. time? How much time? I don't know. But you give the kids enough time. Two? Hero. It takes a hero. My sons didn't have it. My daughter has it. And I'll tell you this. As a teacher, give me another crack at it. I swear to God I'd be a better teacher. <laughs> Friends, I don't mind telling you. I was signing books in Regina at the book in Briar Patch. And I looked up and there was a young, wo a young woman. She was in her mid-40s. There was this old lady standing there looking at me. I can joke like that because I'm no older. Standing there looking at me, and she's giving me the look that we teachers get from ex-students. It was the look that says, you know me. This is what it looks like. <laughs> and I'm supposed to say, I know you. She says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here she is. Don't forget, I, I've taught now for, for 25 years, thousands of students, and this woman is looking at me like, you know me. And I smiled and I said, I know you, don't I? I said, I taught you, didn't I? I said, not a word. And I went back to signing and I stopped and I said, Belinda Ma, I taught you at Wetmore in grade nine in 1973, French and music. She threw herself into my arms and she started to cry and she said, I always knew I was your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell her she was the only Chinese kid in Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. And she said, Mr. Bichard, do you know what we remembered you for? Do you remember uh, the year that Murray was playing hockey in Weyburn and he, colleagues? Absolutely true story. The kid came in a Friday afternoon and said, Mr. Bichard, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, Saturday, I've got a family, two sons, what am I doing tomorrow? My answer is supposed to be nothing. I knew that. I said, Murray, i got nothing going on tomorrow. He said, hey, we're playing hockey in Weyburn, do you want to come watch? What do you say to that? He's from a single family. He's telling me, you play AAA hockey. And I said, yeah, I'd love to, what time? Two o'clock. I put my two sons in the car and I drove an hour and a half through a storm and I watched Murray play hockey. And 28 years later, the kids are talking about me driving to see Murray play hockey. And I said, Belinda, what are you saying? She said, you loved us. I said, well, you were easy to love. But I wish that wasn't my legacy. You know what I'd say to you? I wish you could say to me, Miss Richard, you made me a reader. Do you remember the time you were sitting in your Mini? I've always driven Minis. I still have a Mini in the, in the parking lot. As you know, I've got 25 minutes. <laughs> And she remember the time you were in your mini at the lunch hour reading your book and the boys took it and they start to rock it like that and you hit your head against the window? I said, no, I don't remember it. That's the point. You didn't even know they did it. You do remember the time you're walking down the hallway with that book and you walked into a door and you broke your glasses? <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. I always, and you know what I'm doing now? I've got my PhD in library science and it's because of you, my teacher. That should have been my legacy and I want all of you to know this. My last year as a principal, I got rid of all of my abuse binders, you know, child abuse, how to abuse parents, how to abuse teachers, all those abuse binders, rid of all of those, and I filled my office with 3,000 books, and I became the principal who read, and I had the power to model. Kids need time, they need a role model, and the third thing they need, books. Huge variety of books. They need books, and colleagues, it's your job to make sure that you've got them. Someone maybe you got to find a budget or access it, and you surround yourself books. And when you say to a child, as I do almost every day, you got books in your bedroom, when a kid looks at me and says, no, what do you do now? Signed by an author. You have to make sure that they've got books, but the books have to be two things, colleagues. Listen to me carefully. They have to be inclusive. And here's the problem, Filipinos. That's the problem, Filipinos. Why? They're so bloody nice. I just can't stand it. They're just so nice. They're like newfies. Newfies are everywhere. You watch them. 
Always smiling, always nice. Anyway, the, the, oh, by the way, my best friend in Vancouver, Enrico Samante, he was our custodian. And I want a name like that. I want a name like that. I'd like to be a 17-year-old boy walk over to a girl and say, yo, how you doing? My name is Enrico Samante. <laughs> right now, she wants me. <laughs> I don't know. Or there's option B. Yo, how you doing? My name is Todd. Fail. <laughs> Todd. I know. The problem is this. If you've got somebody from the Philippines in your classroom, you go look in your library and you tell me what book they can identify with, and that's a problem. As that person's teacher, I go online and I start looking. Filipino authors. I look for, and I start bringing stuff in. And the minute you find one and you sign it, you say to that kid, read it, let's talk about it, I read it. You have to identify with our cultures. So if you're talking to a child who's quack quack well, all of a sudden you say, I found a book in your language, in your culture. And the first book that I did at the end, Andy Everson, is called I Am Raven. And I said, Andy, I want to do the book in your language. And he said, okay. And I said, what's your language called? And he said, Chinook. I said, awesome. I want to do it in Chinook. He said, okay, here's the number of our cultural center. And I phoned there, and the woman who answered, I said, I want to do this book in Chinook, and I'm looking for a speaker. She said, our language is not Chinook. I said, well, don't get mad at me. Get mad at Andy Everson. Here's this phone number. <laughs> and she said, it's not. I said, well, what is it? Ladies and gentlemen, I worked for two months trying to find out what Andy's language was. And Andy is the, is the grandson of Chief, uh, of Chief uh, oh, Andy, what's your grandpa's name? Nick, you know, you're all related. <laughs> are you related to Andy Everson? I bet you are. <laughs> no? Okay, here's a little book. Get to know Andy. <laughs> okay, true story. I had to publish the book in English. They couldn't come to agreement with what his language was. So the next book that I did at Andy, called Beneath Raven Moon, this time, I said, Andy, we can circumvent this. We went into one of the villages and we found an elder who spoke their language, Kwakwakwak. And I said, Elder, would you translate the book to your language? She said, yes, I will. So all of a sudden, this book is written in a language of which there are only 135 speakers. And then I said to her, Komox, Elder, we'd like you to record it so we can put it on a CD for people who don't know what your language sounds like. They can hear it. She said, I understand that. I said, so I'll come and get you and we'll go record it in Victoria. No. I said, no, I'm not driving the Malahat with you or with nobody. <laughs> I said, oh, but there's no recording studio on the reserve. She said, you come to my house. Oh. Colleagues, if any of you play this CD and it sounds like it was recorded in her kitchen. <laughs> well, yeah, I swear to God, I could get her out of the house. But all of a sudden, the book was in her language. Friends, I'm on a roll. I dedicated my life about 15 years ago to doing them in our languages. I now have three books in Ojibwe, three in Cree. I have books in Chippewa and Slavey, Swampy Cree. I have books in Inuktitut with Susan Lukar. I have a book in Mi'kmaq. I have a book in Michif, our language, translated by Norman Fleury, the, probably the most fluent, well-recognized voice of the Métis people. I'm on a roll. That's my dream. And in the, uh, this particular book is uh, in Kwakwakwa, done by Andy Everson from Comox. Absolutely spectacular, and it's a story. You know what the story is? Where does Grandmother Moon come from? It's the kind of story that every one of you want. And when you share that story, all you have to do is recognize the source of whence it came and know that you'll always get in trouble with somebody. It's just the way it is in life, especially if you're married. <laughs> so, I'd like to give this book to one of you now and tell me, children need time, a hero. And you know that you have to be their hero if they don't have it. And the third thing they need is books. You know that. But the books have to be two things. Raise your arm if you can tell me what two things a book has to be. A book, miss? Children can connect to the Yes, that they can see themselves in. And the second thing, I didn't tell you the second thing. <laughs> it has to be accessible to them. They have to be able to read it. If they can't read it, they won't read it. So don't give somebody a book that wrong. Don't give a, a, a native book uh, to a, a, an indigenous child and say, here, you'll like this. It's by Joseph Boyd and it's called Yorenda. I don't want to read it. <laughs> what? I'm not going to read it. On the other hand, if you give it to them as an audible, they might. Or the book has to be accessible. And ladies and gentlemen, 74 books I've written, and I call them stepping stones. Almost anybody can read this book. And if you can't read it, let me read it to you. You work your way through, you put it down, and you say, okay, good, give me another one. It takes two things to become a reader. Two, two, two things in the book. It has to be accessible, and it has to include them. Okay. So, back to my first question. What do books have to, to be, sweetie? Miss? 
Yes. And?